Hello. Uh, shall we start, Lindsay? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, well, just to welcome everybody who's in this webinar uh, to our Friday lunchtime talk, um, I'll just start by doing a little housekeeping while everyone joins the webinar. Uh, I'm James. I work with uh, I work in the learning team with Lindsay Storvers, who's with me here, our head of learning, who will chair this conversation. Um, the length of the talk will be about 40 minutes. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions. So please use the Q&A function, which you should be able to navigate to at the bottom of your screens, uh, just to type in questions. We're also recording the talk, although this is a webinar, so none of you will be visible at any point. Um, so that shouldn't matter too much. Lindsay, shall I hand over to you to do proper introductions? And I'll, uh, I'll disappear and then reappear with questions in about 40 minutes. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Lindsay Storvers, Head of Learning at Icon Gallery. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, so our guest presenter is Angela Kingston, who is a freelance curator and writer. Her touring exhibitions since 2013 include 3am, Wonder, Paranoia and the Restless Nights, Blue Coat, The First Humans at Pump House Gallery, and Is This Planet Earth at TPAL. She's written catalogue essays and reviews, taught on MA curating courses at the University of Westminster and Kingston University, been senior researcher in drawing at Wimbledon School of Art, an editor of AN Magazine, and she's also curated and commissioned art for hospitals, chiefly at the Cancer Centre in Birmingham between 1999 and 2005. Angela was curator at Icon Gallery from 1987 to 1994, and today we're going to revisit the exhibitions Mothers from 1990 and Clean and Dirty from 1994. Informed by her research into anthropology and sociology, the exhibitions focused on art's relationship to its political and social context. Kingston discusses her curatorial strategies for, address for addressing HIV and AIDS as a public health emergency and issues of discrimination with regards to disability and gender. We've included public health in the talk's title for today, a large and complex term, which covers the science and art of preventing disease prolonging life and improving quality of life through organised efforts and informed choices of society, organisations, communities and individuals. According to the World Health Organisation, health is a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So Angela, um, this is our first image of ICON when it was on John Bright Street. Uh, your former home. Um, can you tell us a little about this space, um, its location, and how that informs some of your curatorial choices and your engagement with artists and the public? Um, well, um, right, gosh. Um, it was in John Bright Street, which is behind the station, and it was a an area that was supposed to be developed but it didn't really develop so it was kind of quite a rough and ready street and the space itself um, was quite an industrial kind of space and had been kitted out really on quite a tight budget so it had quite a um, big spaces upstairs natural lights downstairs a sort of low um, basement with no natural light so it had masses of scope mm. um, I think before I go into anything I just want to acknowledge that I was part of the most fabulous team um, we're still really really close now um, and just in particular to mention Jeanette Gaynor the the main technician who was so incredible. Alison Edbury, who I learned so much about marketing exhibitions from. Richard Gagola, who is an immensely talented education person. 
and Helen Juffs and Narinda Korkuna, who were wonderful administrators. And, you know, there was always such a lot of dynamism and discussion within the team. And it also that artists were very vocal about what we did and very supportive of what we were trying to do on the whole. And we had many conversations with them that shaped the programme. We were aware of being in a gritty um, industrial city and um, with maybe not such an, um, uh, you know, with people who weren't natural kind of gallery goers. And so we worked really hard for our audiences and Icon Touring did small scale shows that went out to, you know, schools and other kinds of spaces as part of that. Mm. I guess it's also remarkable in that the shows I'm going to talk about were five week slots, fast yeah. turnaround. We could conceive a show and then realize it within about nine months, say. Um, we, I was a 30 year old curator back in 1990. I was given free reign to do quite a risky things. I was given the whole of a major gallery space in the country and I was allocated budgets. They were small, relatively small, but workable. And, the, you know, this is a lot to do with the generosity of the director, Lisanne McGregor, who sort of politically believed in younger people in the team. Well, we weren't that much younger than her, but more junior members of the team having say in what, you know, real say in what happened. Mm. Can I um, can I just um, look, looking at this image? Um, we were looking at we you were actually at Icon. We had lunch yesterday, didn't we? And um, look through our PowerPoint. And um, it was only afterwards that I noticed that in the window here, I don't know if you can see, but there's a. It looks like a TV monitor with the word AIDS on it, and it's facing it's it's positioned so that you can see that image on the street. Now, is this typical of Icon at that time? Does this really encapsulate? what the programme was about, about, you know, um, uh, using text-based art, using mm -hmm. new media, using video, and also handling very big subjects, you know. Um, is that, it, does that pretty much sum up what was happening at the time? I think so. I mean, I think we did a real variety in the programme. Um, you wouldn't want to have a really big issue-based theme show every time. And it was, you know, that would maybe be several times a year in amongst really very different kinds of shows. We felt, you know, privileged to be, you know, the only space of its kind for some miles. So we really felt we were off trying to offer variety. But I mean, the AIDS, the word AIDS, you know, is um, salutary there. I mean, we we had artists who died and friends who died. It was, you know, it, that was, it's a time that I want to try and contextualize in the course of this um, talk. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so um, then uh, moving on to um, mothers. Uh -huh. this be our starting point for today and um you know a catalog that I found at Icon when I first started working there and I've had it on my desk and um and I've enjoyed flipping through it and it just feels so good to be able to talk to you about the show and learn more about it now um so can you tell me a little bit about the um um the development of the exhibition you know where the idea came from and that moment when you um, pitched it to Lizanne McGregor and what her response was to it? Well, I was just conscious that, um, you know, uh, women artists had made a lot of progress um, in the 70s and the 80s in getting their work shown and getting, you know, it valued and so forth. Um, and then a tide seemed to be turning um, perhaps some of them started to make work about um, their children or, or motherhood. And it was like thought to be quite kind of icky. And it was, they were sort of dropped like a ton of bricks, to be honest. And um, it was in the context of a general backlash against feminism, you know, Thatcherism followed by majorism with his back to basics and sort of new laddism men behaving badly on the television, all this kind of stuff. And so it seemed really important to champion the, those women. And, you know, the I've, my hunch was that there was an awful lot of work out there that 
needed to be seen that wasn't being seen. And um, I mean, I suppose, um, you know, it's also to just to say that in the media, babies were being held in the arms of models as accessories. And, um, you know, motherhood was very idealised. It, perhaps it is all part of the, the whiplash, uh, the backlash against feminism. Um, but there was, it was suffocating. There was no space for the sort of often turbulent and dark realities of, of motherhood and being mothered also. Um, and I had um, struggles with my own mother at the time, big time. And I think, like, when I just... I, I, when I said to Lizanne, hey, let's do a show about mothers, it was kind of a joke because it seemed like the worst possible idea for a show, the worst possible climate for th that show. And Lizanne just looked at me and said, let's go for it, you know, um, um, which is a memorable moment. And um, um, you said you had this suspicion that, you know, women and mothers were not being kind of visually presented in 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 the art world in the galleries and that suspicion that you had was met when you put out the call for artists mm -hmm. and you had an overwhelming response um of what was it 200 artists um it, it was actually 300 um and it, it included about um about 40 or 50 men who um who uh, um, you know with, with work about being mothered, which I was very very pleased to see also, and then that was followed by thirty studio visits, and eventually fifteen artists were selected. Okay, and um, should we then um, go on to the uh, uh, the um, first uh, artist who? I mean, we did. We haven't included all the artists, all fifteen artists in this presentation. We have um, made a selection, but we're starting here with Jo Spence, uh, very much linked to the the theme of health, actually. Mm -hmm. And she she wrote an essay in the catalogue, didn't she? Yes. Uh, as well, yes. alongside the show, which is a really great read. And she talks right. about um, at the time of her writing the essay that she was living with cancer and managing her own. Um, treatment holistically and therapeutically mm. um, she was supposed to be on a complete rest but she made an exception to write an essay in the catalogue so it's a very precious essay actually and um is she it is beautifully put um that she had developed this um phototherapy practice i mean she had originated it and worked a lot with rosie martin as her collaborator where um, you know, um, she would, in, in this, in this artwork, um, she is enacting the persona of her, her mother and then countering it with kind of, um, uh, images that sort of liberate her sexuality within that very same domestic context. So she, um, you know, I think, um, uh, and she's working through her, you know, anger and frustration with her mother, but beginning to see her mother in a particular context and moving on um, to have this uh, very, uh, well, they're very witty and um, uh, kind of outrageous and wonderful images, I think. And in fact, that, that one um, was, um, I don't know if you can see because I can't see myself at the moment, but um we the exhibition okay we we did unleash a kind of storm with this exhibition um it uh, it was on the actual masthead of the guardian recognizing the art of mothers on the you know on the very front page and then this huge image of that you can you know you can see there is on the pages of the guardian with you know um uh, you know with what, what you know with that kind of distribution mm. So you have this wonderful kind of conflation of a 1950s housewife with a 1980s working woman, um, you know, and kind of, yeah, trying to reconcile those two, those two kind of positions. And she, she talks a lot and she says the problem is a, and this process of photo, phototherapy that she was engaged with, with her collaborator, Rosie Martin, it was um, very private and it was trying to break a familial silence around motherhood. Mm -hmm. And she says this is very much a structural problem. It's a language problem. 
and you know she doesn't have the words to articulate so she's having to come up with a visual language really in order to negotiate the anger that she feels and really turn the relationship with her mother around yes 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 and um, should we have a look at the other there's a, we've got a couple more images from that series i think is that that's that it's a long series is it there about 14 works mm-hmm. in the whole Yes, it was a big, um, a very big display um, of multiple images. Um, And, you know, that's the one on the left, um, you know, is quite a miserable child cowering behind this Mm. sort of menacing vacuum cleaner. And then on the right, it's this ecstatic smearing with menstrual blood, you know, that blood that must, that should always remain hidden and taboo is actually... Um, you know, um, completely visualised. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, this whole idea of sexual expression, but also, se- you know, women's sexual health as well, you know. Um, yeah. That's something that we can kind of talk a bit more about um, as we go along. But um, When you mentioned the title of the talk about art and health, I couldn't quite see where the health aspect was in um, mothers, but you've helped me understand understand where it is yeah yeah um should we move on then to um flick allen felicity allen's um yeah, so here's the title mothers um which was designed by um uh tony arafin arafin and arafin who did the catalog as well didn't they yes yes and you um, said you said that they did they did it gold they what the idea was that it, the gold would come off on your fingers as yeah. because there is some very very there is some very, very positive images of mothers and mothering, but there is also quite a lot of this sort of more turbulent, darker stuff. And so, and that probably predominates in the end. And Tony's idea was that you would have this gold as a kind of foil to the the kind of wretched, dark, you know, um, undercurrents of the show. And and the idea that it would come off on your hands was very, very beautiful. Mm-hmm. I think we had a lot of pleasure putting these publications together. Mm-hmm. It's really a really beautiful thing. And um, so here in the background, you can see the work of Felicity Allen, and um, who's a, um, a writer, a curator, a artist who works in painting, photography, and currently a lot in video as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think uh, the... The brilliant thing about Felicity Allen's work is that she's able to bring in these different voices and these multiple perspectives. And it feels very much something that she was doing here in these works as well. Mm-hmm. I think um, uh, it's um, juxtaposing these, you know, kind of babies falling through dark space um, and being sort of caught and caressed at the same time. They're very, very highly charged. And big images and then juxtaposed with you know fruit being peeled it's very very sort of intuitive stuff Mm. and um you know something of that sort of ecstatic obsessional um relationship that mothers can have with their babies and um I can't I what I remember very very vividly is soon after the we opened the doors I walked into the space and there was a very heavily pregnant woman lying on the floor in front of this work and seeming very comfortable where she was. And she had her toddler running round and round um, kind of very happily in the space. And and I think that's exciting when you feel like the, you know, the gallery is no longer yours. It is this, you know, people have found it and made it their own. And that child, who knows, may have been responsible for a con- conservation issue that we had in that a child with greasy fingers, greasy hands, had laid their hands repeatedly on that image of the falling baby. Oh, yes. And um, yes, <laughs> but what an amazing kind of bit of audience feedback. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the I mean, I can so identify with that image of the falling baby. I mean, that is just when you're a new parent, that is the biggest fear that you're going to drop the baby or that someone else is going to drop the baby. And then also and then you have these anxieties around feeding the baby as well. You know, right. when you're feeding from milk 
solids and everything and it, it it's just a, it can make you really ill it becomes an obsession you know and it can make you really poorly of course you give them mashed up banana and mashed up avocado so yeah, yeah. yeah. sort of weaning right. food yeah right. maybe yeah. we can actually we've got another slide here of some more um babies and um and um fruits and vegetables as well yeah which is just delicious that that one there that's kind of they look like astronauts or something don't they kind of <laughs> hurtling through them there's a, there's a wonderful um, short story by Angela Carter where she loves her baby so much that she roasts it in the oven and eats it. <laughs> and then I've got a, actually I've got a quite a nice quote here from Flick. Um, the the work comes from my discussions with and observations of mothers and non and, and non mothers, male and female, rather than from an autobiographical stance. The photographic work directly represents our cultural ambivalence towards babies. And again, I mean, you mentioned it at the start of the talk, you know, babies were being used as fashion accessories at this time, weren't they? Mm -hmm. There was the iconic image of the man um, holding the baby in the early 90s. Yes, that poster, that poster. But they weren't, they weren't, they weren't babies that were puking and crying and you know or or even very interactive you know yeah yeah um so we'll move on then to the next slide um, yeah um so um big one of the great benefits of it being open submission and we just did believe politically that we needed to do at least one a year um uh is that of course, you have to consider work that, you know, is um, coming from very different places with very different aesthetics. And I love this work on the left by Aurora Ben Goetia, um, where, um, you know, it, these were all very personal choices, but I could actually relate to this idea of, you know, hills melding into one another as mother and child images very very beautiful and actually they yes yes very gorgeous I yeah she talks about in the catalogue she talks about close body smell of organic cells glands and nature mm. it mm. feels like they're trying you know with these works and also with Virginia um Bodman whose um uh pictures are on the wall behind her um, you know, they're trying to visualise something that's um, visualise something that's invisible. You know, around kind of um, fertility and around um, around uh, pregnancy as well. Virginia yeah. says that she's trying to um, she's drawing these organic um, objects that um, are like veins, placenta, breasts, inside and outside, and trying to envisage what's happening within. Yeah. Um, because they're and coming up with this visual language exactly to express something that you know you feel but you don't actually can't kind of see or witness um mm. Mm. yes yes they wonderful um she decided not to use oil paints while she was pregnant and she used ink and linseed oil which kind of slightly fought against each other and got soaked into the paper and so on they're very sort of visceral i keep thinking of the word visceral but visceral you know very gritty and messy and interesting drawings yeah and yeah, quite abstract actually but again they have this kind of part object this kind of fragmentary kind of feel in relation to the figure and the body mm. um then we have beth fisher yes very large scale um drawings um beautiful beautiful drawings um and monoprints and paintings um where she's reflecting on herself as you know an a, a mother you know a little bit older with her children about to leave home and um reflecting on that so a very mm -hmm. important dimension mm -hmm. And somebody who's, yeah, again, a kind of very, uh, she's American, isn't she? But interested in the figure, very committed to the human form and figure. Yeah, yeah. in Scotland. And then um, Claire Charnley. Yeah, I think Claire's here, actually. 
Um, a brilliant um, uh, artist working with video and mixed media, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and was was this sorry? Is it photography or is it a video? That's what I meant to ask you with this one. It is. Um, there were eggs that were on top of a perspex, which was at a distance from a photograph of her holding eggs, and the eggs on the per- perspex um, threw shadows on that image. And then there are these photographs of babies wrapped in blankets that are on the ground. And um, I think you pointed out how lovely her statement in the catalogue is. It's quite devastating, really, yeah. Yeah, it's... I um, like to read it. I find dropping eggs particularly hard to explain. I think this is because it holds so many contradictions. Yeah, that's all she says about it. And it- I just love this um, response um, by James Hall um, to the piece. Um, it's one of those... Um, reviews that you really dream of where people are completely in you know inside the work and it's almost like stream of consciousness writing and he wrote um his reflection was birth seems casual and callous babies a forlorn mess on the kitchen floor (laughs) (laughs) um there's this that it throughout the catalogue and the writing in the catalogue there's this word taboo that keeps coming up Mm. And it's actually um, Catherine Elwes, who we don't have an image of her work here, but she was an exhibitor and an essayist. And she talks about a real sense of words failing me in the face of the unspeakable experiences of motherhood, yeah. you know, and trying to break break with those taboos. And I, I mean, you know, there's the, the eggs here and this this thing around fertility as well, you know, around certain kind of subjects of women's health and gynecology that we still don't know much about, you know, um, uh, polycystic ovary syndrome and, you know, endometriosis, things that would affect fertility. I, IVF was available at this time, wasn't it? It was available since the late like, 70s, but it was a private thing, wasn't it? It wasn't available on the health service until the early 2000s or something. And right. I think it was something that people spoke about or even the press were really talking mm-hmm. about at the time, were they? Yes. There's a wonderful essay by Hilary Robinson. Um, and, you know, uh, these were, you know, she was quite young at the time and, and she's a key writer now and thinker, and feminist thinker. And she really does set the scene for um, the circumstances around images, the, la- mis- you know, the, the, the images of the maternal body were missing and images of this experience were missing Mm -hmm. and um i'll um i'll 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 scan those essays and put them on my website soon i think i'll have i'll put these in a new archive section Mm -hmm. um as there's this kind of interest at the moment Mm -hmm. um so then uh we've got bridget mcdonald's um Mm -hmm. scale charcoal drawings i think they are is that right Yes, I think Bridget's here as well, which is great. Um, And, um, you know, the generosity of artists to take part in these exhibitions, you know, shouldn't, you know, you can never underestimate it. I mean, they they are putting their trust in you. And I think she was told that she was warned by her tutors at Wolverhampton Poly not to apply for this show because they didn't think it would be very good for for her career. So... I think it's quite interesting. That's what she sent in an email recently. And these works are very intense, beautiful um, charcoal drawings um, that are kind of um, based around um, Sylvia Plath's um, beekeeping poems. Um, And um, obviously Sylvia Plath is a really key figure in terms of writing about um, aspects of um, motherhood that we usually remained unspoken. Um, And, um, but I do notice the sort of family resemblances in these drawings by Bridget um, of her own, you know, her and her um, husband and children and so forth. It's definitely the face. Um, and um, maybe we'll hear from her in the kind of comments and discussion off, uh, later on. Mm. 
it's nice this idea of being able to choose your mother being able to adopt a literary mother isn't it oh, that's a great that's a great way of putting it it really is yeah. and then the kind of poetics of motherhood are taken into Daksha uh, Caroline Jarawala's work which I think is the next slide yes yes I'm aware that we're taking we're we're not progressing really quickly enough I'm a bit worried about time. Yeah, that, I think we can. Well, this is our last image for um, for mothers, and then we'll move on to clean and dirty. So, yes, I love this work for its colours and its, you know, its reflections on, um, you know, a second generation immigrant, really, you know, having a relationship to the mother country through their mothers, very, very importantly. And, you know, this uh, Gujarati patterning comes into this and Gujarati um, foods come into this um, sort of suite of paintings. Very, very, very beautiful and beautiful and, and um, slightly precarious compositions that I like a lot. Okay, okay so then um, maybe we'll then um, move on to... Um the exhibition clean so if you could just tell us a little bit about the idea for this and the development of the exhibition that would be great right so this is 1994 so um it i think the curator you know cu curators are looking for sort of tendencies in i would always be trying to see work in artist studios and try and um, understand artists preoccupations and I was just noticing that there was a tendency for sculptors to use really sort of squeaky clean synthetic materials. And that struck me as really interesting. And then on the other hand, so I was kind of developing an idea around that and kind of in a different part of my head, I was noticing this sort of groundswell of artists making, you know, kind of visceral, I use the word again, work about difficult subjects. Um, and then it seemed to me that those two exhibitions could be presented together. So clean and dirty happened at the same time. And oh, oh this gives you an idea of this is more press coverage for mothers and um, just gives you an idea. But just to change the page, if you can see it. I love that poster. OK, so it's clean and dirty and it's made with a J cloth and that's made with cleaning fluid and dirt you know dust to make the dirty um so um and it it's important really to set the context it goes you know we'd had thatcherism we were in the middle of majorism and it was like really like a blame culture um so single mothers homosexuals benefit scroungers economic migrants trade tra tra travelers there was like this finger pointing at different groups that would seem to be the problem you know at any one time in the media and um just to give you the context for clean and dirty at the same time hiv hiv and age you've already mentioned you know the first death in the uk was 1981 and the deaths peaked in 1994 95 with under just under 2000 a year section 28 um was introduced in 1988 and it pro prohibited us from promoting homosexuality etc etc and you know um horrible to remember her but a wiener curry duna health minister said good christian people don't get aids um war and unrest iran iraq war wars in bosnia serbia slovenia croatia early 90s a lot of people fleeing from that conflict, a lot of um, discussion about, um, you know, an unwillingness to take refugees, um, a picking apart of their motivations. Um, the troubles in Northern Ireland, um, very, very intense period at this time, um, strategic bombing of economic targets in the um, city of London, and censorship of um, the voices of Sinn Féin and Irish Republican and Loyalist groups and a refusal to meet with Sinn Féin um, on the part of um, the British government. So, um, the, you know, so you've got this kind of repressive stuff, which I think 
the um yeah if we uh if we could go on to the first slide of clean so um it's eric bainbridges um there's like a i think it's an air freshener container or something made huge and covered with you know it's surface is this white funfair and then a um a box of teaspoons and then you can just see on the back wall um craig woods um he took the um bottoms of like cleaning um cleaning um materials and drilled mm -hmm. drilled those those sort of codes and letters into the wall and these made really quite lush drawings um and it was just that um, the clean and dirty, the whole approach was really informed by Mary Douglas, Purity and Danger and Analysis of Concepts of Pollution and Taboo, in, written in 1966. It's a fabulous read if you're interested in this area. And she said that a preoccupation with purity is the enemy of change, of ambiguity and compromise, and by extension, the enemy of life. Um, so if we could have the next slide. And we've got Una Rose Smith's work um, in the foreground here with Eric Bainbridge's in the background. And um, Una's work really triggered the whole idea for the clean show. It was these sort of extraordinary plastic objects that we were um, certainly accumulating at a very rapid rate and um, how prescient this work was and is and she would combine you know she observed this these sort of jelly molds or again um you know uh, uh domestic cleaning product type objects and they would be sort of mismatched and beautifully bound together it was very immaculately presented and um I just want to read from um the guardian review um robert clark the cleanliness so, so perfectly embodied in these works relates to a disturbing tendency over the last, in, last 15 years or so for the concept of desirable or respectable cleanliness mm. to have all kinds of social, sexual and racial connotations. Mm. Yeah, and there was a, just to say that there's the catalogue that went alongside this exhibition, yeah. well, the two exhibitions and brought them together and the typographical contaminations in this, um, in this book are designed by Pavel Buchler. Yes. Um, and in, in your introduction here, he's highlighted all of those words like dirty, contamination, pestilence, scum of society. Um, and you talk about how, you know, any, anything that was countercultural, any, anything that, you know, went against the norm or against the mainstream, you know, was, was spoken of in these terms. Um, and there's a fantastic essay in here by the eco campaigner Bernadette Bally. Bally, yeah. Yes. About, I guess in relation to Una's work, you know, this idea of our obsession with the orderliness and the cleanliness within the home and the exposure that, to chemicals, particularly for women, you know, um, with their kind of sanitary products and everything, air, air fresheners, everything, the amount of chemicals that we're exposed to within a domestic setting. Mm. Um, yeah. Yes, it's a great collection of essays, and I just invited the the writers to really write their most unguarded, the most unguarded essay that they would like to write. write and I promised not to censor them. Um, so we've got Sarat Maharaj on race, um, Simon Watney on AIDS, HIV, Fiona Barber on Irish politics. Bob Findlay on disability politics, John Taylor on class. So um, we, yes, it would, it would, it, it, it's um, again. I'll put it on my website in case people are interested. I won't be able to do it straight away, but I will do it. 
I mean, these artists as well, you say that the, the white cube gallery space was a kind of, you know, becoming a problem as well for you, that kind of idea of like that pure experience of experiencing like a modernist painting or something. And those artists with their synthetic materials and their like extreme hyper whiteness of their work that they were trying to achieve were really, un, were really reflecting that, that context of the gallery. And then with Dirty, then you kind of have a different color scheme for the gallery in certain parts as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I started to think, well, are curators like hygienists, you know, disavowing the dirt in the world? Do you know what I mean? So, so yes. Um, yeah, this is um, work by Brian Jenkins, um, an artist, um, and you know, we painted the walls red at his request. And um, it's work um, where you, it, it, it's a much more intimate space downstairs and you would sort of turn a corner and be in quite a small confined space um, with sort of wraparound drawings of his naked body um, and a very sort of a, a sort of not a, um, a rather atypically shaped body, which I think played on interestingly on sort of Schiller and Klimt and um, you know other um, artists. Um, and it there there are these photographs of some very very intimate thing, um, um, you know, happening within the photographs, although it remains quite ambiguous what it is. And it, it's just people's alarm at the sexuality of um, disabled people. Mm. And I think, did you mention earlier the Disability Act that came in the year after this, didn't it? Um, it was This was 94 and that came in in 1995. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, there's a oh. lot of campaigning at that time yeah. going on. Yeah. In, oh. yeah. yeah. Um, so then uh, uh, we've got Nicola, uh, Pe oh, Lockie Morris, sorry. Lockie Morris. I love this one. I think he might be with us. Um, Can I just read that? So it's toilet paper, cling film, adhesive, ink, sealed with a flame. What it's, fantastic materials. Yeah. <laughs> it's called comms, and I'll hold up an image of it. It was huge, lots and lots of pairs of tongues. Can you see that okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. And um, that icon gallery, that installation, wasn't it? That's the shot. Yes, yes. Wow. So it was all these amazing um, pairs of tongues um, that referred to comms, which were the illicit communications in and out of prisons in Northern Ireland. And um, so written on toilet paper and wrapped in cling film and, in, um, tra you know, transmitted, you know, they were smuggled in, in, in the anuses and mouths and so forth of uh, visitors and, and prisoners and um, in and out and uh, and obviously you know it's work that sort of slides across into other kind of the whole sort of sense of danger around the exchange of body fluids at the time um, mm. and um, so it does slide into um, you know it's very much touching on censorship and the sort of resistance to censorship and the sort of pleasures of resistance and um and and it does kind of slide into i mean the whole sort of the time of which it at which it was made you you couldn't do you know you 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 wouldn't disassociate it with the sort of whole preoccupations um connected with the aids hiv mm. and then we have nicola nicola this piece made of sugar, is yeah. that right? Yeah, she made sugar chandeliers, um, and there was and the the there's what, what one that looks that that's kind of as if it's covered in one of those bags to protect it, and we had done like a white carpet underneath it, and the sugar dripped onto the carpet, and it was just this idea that you you know we have these courtship rituals, but uh, you know that can be very sort of formalized and kind of. Um, they can have all these kind of trappings and, um, you know, and um, I suppose there's something a bit of the fairy tale about um, chandeliers, but what we're dealing with is quite a messy coupling and exchange. Mm. Uh, yeah, Life is a dirty business. 
as I'm um, quoting myself when I was interviewed by Radio 4. <laughs> Uh, so uh, our last image actually is uh, Alistair Raphael um, of the empty bed. So uh, yeah, if a description of this would be great. Um, so um, this is the, the the image of the double bed um, has a tiny little cam uh, video inset in the middle of an open heart surgery, and then there were light boxes and um, inset into the walls. Um, which were sort of like um, bacteria and viruses growing on petri dishes, and um, uh, and it was suggesting, you know, that this the, these contaminate, you know, the sort of uh, the dangers of the dangers of intimacy and the sort of seeping in of contamination, um, you know, through the sort of very walls or or um, so on it um a very very sort of intuitive work that's quite difficult perhaps to put into words mm -hmm. and am i right in thinking they were an activist as well were they an AIDS activist and we had a yes. someone in the um simon watney in the in the catalogue writing a, de a quite a devastating guess actually um you know talking about the um campaign you know we focus mostly in america around the campaign to get this recognised as a national and a global health crisis and to have equal access um, to treatment for people, you know, that was not, yeah, it was just not accessible at that time. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So the, uh, uh, that's the end of our presentation. And so should we have um, a few, 10 minutes, I think we've got for some audience questions. And I think James is going to come back in to... Hello. Hey. Uh, that was great. Thanks for the talk both. It was so interesting. and went really quickly, didn't it? <laughs> um, we've got one question so far. So I just invite anyone else in the audience to type questions into the Q&A if you've got any. Uh, there's one from Helen who says, I can't remember even though I was there at the time. Was the end of fertility discussed as part of the show? So this is in relation to mothers. Um, she said that this speaks volumes about my attitude to menopause or the taboos associated with it at the time. Mm. And and mentioned that there's much in the news recently with uh, things such as the Davina McCall documentary, which I think was on television a few months ago. Well, Helen was in that documentary. It's well worth seeing if, if it, it, it seems to be a very, um, it's a last gaining presence, um, issues around menopause and um, Helen's quite an activist. Um, yes, I think that we did have it there, but um, maybe I didn't sort of quite recognise it. Um, I think Aurora Bengoachia made the work when she um, was unable to conceive. Um, and I think that Beth Fisher's work that we looked at, you know, is, is a kind of... Uh, I mean, rough, you know, roughly her children were leaving home and she is, she is, there are, you know, self portraits of herself as this older, um, probably, you know, somewhere around the menopause kind of body, well, isn't one that you, you see very much of. So I think it, I think it was there. Um, but perhaps, you know, we'll see more of that. Yeah, I just feel that. You know, um, I'm a, of the generation that has really been benefited from this kind of work, you know, that, that, that in opening up this space and developing these visual languages and strategies to talk about these issues that, you know, that affect, that affect us all, all women, you know, in different ways. And, you know, I know that you had quite, you said in your catalogues, Icon has to be a place of discussion and debate. So is this something you'd have talks in the galleries and be inviting people to try and articulate what was going on? Well, I think you did some work uh, looking at the programmes, the, uh, you know, the talks and education programmes about it. And, and so it'd be interesting to see what you yeah, thought. About that. I know that Richard Gagola, like with all of these, especially the themed exhibitions, they just had such a like lively talks programme, you know, with people from across different sectors as well, not just from within the arts. 
um, you know, and it's something that I always aspire to with um, with our events program as well. And looking back at that time, and you know, really trying to set up the kind of the discourse around very difficult subjects. You know, mm-hmm. it's another thing I suppose that remains consistent. Along with you mentioned younger staff. I mean, that's something that we definitely still encourage at Icon. So something mm. that's still there 20 years later. Mm. Um, there's a few more questions now, which is great. Uh, you'll have to excuse my pronunciation on the next one. Um, so Ed has asked, uh, was, I, I think it's Merle Lederman Ukele's work an important precursor? Did the exhibitions go beyond the object towards performance and inaction? Mm. Yes. Um, there was a wonderful performance by Bobby Baker where she created an action painting using um, a couple of shopping bags full of um, flour and treacle and ketchup and all sorts of um, very, um, uh, uh, you know, those kinds of materials. Um, so yes, we, we, we had a performance. Um, we could probably have had more. Um, and yes, the artist that you mentioned, she's definitely a kind of precursor. And I think Hilary Robinson puts her fingers on other artists who really um, sort of pioneered or, or, or did much to start to um, liberate the kind of images that could be create, you know, uh, liberate the sort of imagery that you could have around mothers and mothering. So she mentions Suzanne Valadon, Frida Kahlo, Monica Sue, and of course, Mary Kelly. So yes, they def, you know, these artists made, um, yes, in the preceding decades, um, certainly stuff had, um, had, you know, there were, certainly people were making amazing progress but it was this sense that that was that people were kind of attempting to block further a continuation of that tendency so there's another um perhaps linked in some way question here from bridget who says great to revisit the old icon and mothers thank you angela uh do you have any thoughts on how art and curation has changed 30 years on Gosh, that's a huge question, Bridget. <laughs> um, art and curation. I think, I think that you can find how curating's changing if you go to the smaller artist-led spaces. And I, but I, and I think you. Oh, look at the cat. Um, <laughs> Um, so, yes, I mean, I'm, I'm concerned that we don't hear from those 30 year, 25, 30 year old curators in the big major spaces. Um, but yes, um, much, much more, you know, the whole issue about how you curate participatory work is very, very live. And there's a wonderful show at Grand Union at the moment that um, looks at that for sure. Um, and as for art changing, well, it's changed and stayed the same, hasn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> handily, there are two other questions now, both kind of linked to each other as well. So Annika has asked, and this is probably as much a question for us, Lindsay, as, mm-hmm. as um, sorry, Annika has asked, um, these exhibitions aren't on Icon's online archive, uh, she thinks. Are there plans to upload, especially given the current show's context? Um, well, we're in the process of digitising the archive at the moment, so as you can imagine, that's quite a big undertaking. But um, and then this series of events that we have, which are, you know, working with the curators and with the artists from this decade, um, to revisit through the archive the works that they did and think about what strategies they've continued to use and would use now. Um, so yeah, it's these are resources that we're in the process of developing at the moment. Um, yeah, and so there was another similar question um, from Aideen who says, uh, how do you prevent institutional amnesia so that these discussions around othering are not lost? 
and that the work created at ICON is readily available through the archive process. I suppose it's the same question, really, Lindsay. You know, we have a talk actually, which we'll plug at the end, um, which is being uh, hosted by ICON's archivist, isn't it, Kirsty North? Mm -hmm. So I'll mention that at the end. And then the final one, um, seeing as we're over time, is from Virginia. He says, not a question. Um, just an interesting note that while tape teaching in fine art departments in the 90s onwards, that the most stolen library book was the mother's catalogue. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that's a nice note to uh, conclude the talk, Lindsay. Oh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to say, Angela, thanks so much. I mean, there is something, you know, there has been a, a it's kind of taboo subject in our talk, and that's, you know, we're talking about public health now and COVID, you know. Um, and I, it'd be really interesting just to hear, just as an end note, you know, what what you what your projects what you're working on at the moment, and where what where do you feel where do you feel this work best sits, you know, um, this curatorial work is it in galleries or is it in hospitals or it, where whereabouts where is the ideal context to have these conversations that we desperately need to have now around what we've experienced uh, with COVID. Um... Yeah, wow, wow. Gosh, throw me a big question right <laughs> at the end. <laughs> well, maybe that's a question to all of us, like, you know, what are we going to do now? <laughs> I think it will take time because when you think that, I think, um, like, um, I did see the most wonderful um, um, exhibition online called Touch Me, by Veronica Newkirch, N-E-U-K-I-R-C-H, and Veronica with a K, where, and there's, a, um, there's some reviews and part of it still online, um, where it was about a year ago when we were suddenly um, touch deprived, you know, um, you know and, and it's a very brilliant response where she got all these artists to interact physically with their work as a response to that. And I think very often artists are quite lateral and very, very imaginative and, you know, very, very sort of creatively indirect. You know, there's, this is very early days with COVID. Um, you know, we were looking, you know, the, we were 10 years into the sort of AIDS situation by the time of the clean and dirty shows. Mm -hmm. And there's just such a lot to unpack with COVID. You know, there's the, you know, all the 20,000 needless deaths, the black communities being very hard hit, the seeming expendability of people in care homes. And, you know, it, it's a huge subject and I'm beginning to get inklings of it. And and I, I sort of feel this deep need to see stuff about it when it comes through. Mm, yeah, that's it. So um, maybe then we'll end on that note, but it's I think it's a powerful note to end on. And um, I look forward to having continuing the conversation with you around that, Angela. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for the opportunity to talk yeah. about this. It, it, um, it, it you know, it's um, very, pre very precious to me. Thank okay. you. Thanks, both. Um, and yeah, and so the exhibition's open at Icon until the 30th of August. Um, so please come and see it if you haven't already. Uh, we're closed on Mondays, but open every other day of the week, and the booking is on. Uh, icons website and then the talk that i briefly mentioned before which is next friday's lunchtime talk so it's friday the 9th of july 1 till 2 p.m um icons archivist kirsty north reviews footage of anthony anthony Meralda's the honeymoon project so please book on for that if you're interested okay thanks both thank you thank you